Good evening, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. It is another blessed Friday. As you can see before me, I have a big vessel of some apples here. And uh, like anything, the moment you pick it, they begin to spoil. Now, these aren't real apples, but they are uh, replica apples. But you can see even some of them are colored in such a way that they're beginning to deteriorate. And next to that, I have an apple of gold. And that should give you a hint about what we're talking about tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about a word fitly spoken is as apples of gold and pictures of silver. That's what the scripture tells. We're going to drill down and get to the bottom of that. And as we begin this evening, we're going to have some uh, interesting opening thoughts in general about how we use our mouth. The Bible has a whole lot to say about that. I pray you've had a blessed week for you guys joining in. And actually, you may not know this, but I am not sitting at this desk at this very moment. This is ahead of time that this sermon was prepared because we are actually on the road today meeting up with some of our lovely spiritual family in another state that we could worship together. Uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to make sure that we were here on Friday night. So we are actually recording this on... Today is Wednesday. It's Wednesday night. Sorry, it took me a minute. It's been a heavy season of exercise. Well, I pray you guys are doing well, and uh, there's not really any announcements. We're going to be on the road this weekend, and then shortly after that, and then shortly after that. we got some stuff coming up. I pray you've had a blessed week. I pray that you're coming into your rest, and I pray that you are open to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit tonight. And before we open up the Bible, before we begin, let us have a word of a prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Forgive our sins, forgive our trespasses, forgive our debts. Lord, bless us with your presence in spirit and in truth. And as we fellowship together, Lord, I pray that your spirit would move on us like light from heaven, that it would bless us, Lord, immensely with your presence. Let us to embrace the things of heaven and let go of the fallen things of earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we'll turn with me to Proverbs 18 and 21. We're going to start with that verse. That's not the verse for the night, but I'm going to start with that verse. We're going to talk a little bit about it. And we're going to roll right along, and you guys can comment right in the comments, and I will go back and read every one of them, because this time they're not going to be deleted, because uh, even though this is going to be released on Friday night, it's not a live stream, so I'll be able to see them, and that's kind of cool that they don't delete the comments after the live stream. Proverbs 18 and 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of thereof. Now the Bible has a whole lot to say about the tongue and about fruit. And brothers and sisters, I've been noticing a trend and a pattern which seems to be, I don't know if it's worse than ever, maybe it's the same as ever, maybe we're just noticing it more than ever, of people harshly using their tongues uh, in dealing with other people. Maybe with their husbands or wives, maybe with their children. And uh, let me start with this thought. Brothers and sisters, correction does much, but encouragement does more. How often as Christians do we talk about how pride is dangerous? And it is true, pride is dangerous. But for every child dying from pride, there are a hundred dying from lack of praise. Maybe nobody has ever told them that they do a good job. Maybe no one has ever told them that they are wanted or that they are loved or that they have good qualities. In many cases amongst Christians, there can be a lopsided focus placed on calling out negative things and negative qualities. Now, an imbalance then takes place where pointing out mistakes happens far more than thanking people for what they do right or acknowledging what they're doing better. And while it is true that correction is necessary and that we must correct things that are wrong, there are some children, even some adults, who only know correction and know very little or nothing of encouragement. Now, it takes genuine effort. It takes real spiritual effort to encourage others and to build them up in the right way. While, on the other hand, it takes almost no effort to scream, shout, or to complain and criticize things that are wrong. The eight, nine, ten things that are good, 
that people do that are good, that your husband or wife does that are good, or your children does that are good, the 10 things they do good go unnoticed, unpraised, and unacknowledged. But let them unload the dishwasher wrong once, or forget to bring the mail in, or wet the bed. And how quick do we make haste to tell them what an undisciplined wretch they are? Now, in some cultures, this is more common than others. And I have often winced in spiritual pain while walking through a park, hearing some parents shrieking at their child that they're stupid, or yelling and screaming dramatically over the smallest of offenses. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever seen someone shrieking and yelling at a child, even calling them dumb? Is your heart not torn for such a child to pray for them? You know, the other night, brothers and sisters, I was walking in a city park with my wife, and we passed a family getting into a van. And I heard, as it were, a mother or father screaming at a child who had gotten into the wrong seat. And they said, oh my, mm, you are, what are you doing? You are dumb. Oh my gee, what are you doing? Now it was painful to hear somebody who God had trusted with the precious soul of a child, speaking to a child in such a way, not only taking the Lord's name in vain, but mocking and belittling the child and telling them they were dumb, but I hadn't walked much farther when I heard something far more painful. It was one of the little children's voices suddenly yelling at another one of the little children, oh my gee, you an idiot, oh my gee, oh my gee, and dramatically taking the Lord's name in vain, loudly, half a dozen times, a 12-year-old child, a 12-year-old girl was screaming at a nine-year-old child, calling them dumb in an even louder voice, oh my gee, you dumb. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. We don't have to wonder where this child has learned such an awful behavior because we had just heard her own mother showing her how to do it. And it seemed to me that it was very likely that she had not only heard her mother, but her father and maybe her aunts and uncles and maybe the rest of her family. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to wonder why such children do not grow up to become successful doctors or engineers or real estate tycoons or have affluent lives or grow up and live in a peaceful, nice neighborhood with clean, nice houses and nice things. We don't have to wonder why these kids don't get to grow up and have a beautiful life. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about why some neighborhoods are nicer than others, and why some people grow up and succeed in life and live in nicer neighborhoods, while others fail and end up in prison and jail or dead and homeless. And there's been a lot of talk in modern times about how such things are very unfair and that everybody deserves equal results, that we should all get the same thing. Everyone deserves equal results, but brothers and sisters, it just cannot be so. You see a child of any color, white, black, Mexican, Chinese, Asian, any child of any color who is nurtured by their parents, tutored by their parents, who is tenderly raised by parents who show them genuine, gentle love every day is inevitably going to go on and in most cases have a successful and joyful adult life. On the other hand, a child who has parents who yell at her with loud voices daily, oh my gee, you dumb over the littlest thing, calling the child dumb repeatedly, just cannot get the same results as the child of the other parents. That child just cannot get the same equal results and will not get the same equal results in life as that other child. Brothers and sisters, there is just no way to bring equal results out of such unequal parenting. And I think of that little girl in the park taking the Lord's name in vain and screaming at the other little kids in the car. And I realized she was only doing what she had been taught and her parents were only doing what they had been taught and that there was a generational curse. And you know something? If you tell a kid that they are dumb enough times, they'll soon start to believe it. When is the cycle going to end? Brothers and sisters, we must give no quarter to this nonsense. There can be no shelter and no quarter for it. In our families, we must not tolerate such behaviors and we must encourage the better. 
If we want better lives for our children, for our communities, for our families, for our future, then we've got to do it God's way. It's got to be God's way, brothers and sisters. We cannot live and build families and communities contrary to God's way and expect that we're going to all have sunshine and rainbows and God's results when we're not following God's plan. Now, I am not speaking about a color or a race. I am not speaking about whites or blacks or Mexicans or Chinese or any such thing. I am speaking about the way of love. I am speaking about God's way. We cannot raise our children or tend to our marriages without love and expect things to work out happily ever after. We cannot be rotten to our children and our husbands and wives and our families and our communities and then complain that there are other places nicer than where we're at, that other families are happier than ours. Brothers and sisters, these are not my laws. They are the laws of the very universe itself. Because the universe teaches us quite portentously that there are consequences to our actions. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, the Bible tells us that there are consequences to our actions. And before I go any further, I would make a special appeal to you tonight. If you are watching tonight and you are one of those children whose parents shouted at them and belittled them and dealt with them in so many rotten ways, if you had parents who screamed and cussed at you, who were loud and never encouraged you and yelled at you over the smallest things, if you were one of those children, you have a choice tonight. You are standing at a crossroads. The entire universe is looking at you this very moment. You can be the one who breaks off the generational curse from your family forever. You can be the difference maker. You can be the one that stands in the gap. The first one to usher in love and wellness and health for all those that come after you. You can say that ugliness and hatefulness and darkness ran into my family until it ran into me. You can be that person. And yes, you can do it. You can do it, brothers and sisters. I know that God will help you. And I know that you can really be the very first one to break the cycle. You can be the first one who went from being hateful, from being bitter, from speaking hasty and angry words, to being the loving encourager. You can be the very first one, brothers and sisters. It may be that you were born into a thorn patch and we see a hill covered with thorns, hundreds of thorny bushes all over it. You say, well, I was born into them thorns, but there is always a single rose which blossoms first amongst the thorns where there was previously none. You can be the thing that blossoms in this universe. God will help you. You can do it. God will help you. Don't blame the thorns. Don't say, look at all the thorns. I don't see any beauty here. You can be the very first blossom. You can be that new thing. God will help you. Now tonight, to that end, we're going to look at a Bible verse which speaks about the sacred power of encouragement. Because it's true that correction is necessary, but so is encouragement. And it is my testimony that encouragement often accomplishes much more than corruption. Correction. Have you ever heard of this tremendous quote? It's an old quote from Booker T. Washington. Have you ever seen the tremendous results of encouraging others? Here's the quote. Booker T. Washington once said, Few things can help an individual more than to place responsibility on him and let him know that you trust him. Now that is an incredible thought. Letting somebody else know that you really think that they can succeed might make the difference of life or death for that person. And you know, the Bible says it right here, Proverbs 18 and 21. Do you think this is moonshine? Do you think this is rhetoric and exaggeration? Or is this the very law of the spiritual universe that God has revealed through Scripture? It says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Brothers and sisters, letting someone else know that you really do think they can succeed, being a difference maker who encourages them, can often mean the difference between life and death. And you know, brothers and sisters, I'll freely acknowledge it can often be a source of strain and difficulty in our lives 
when we're dealing with someone who lets us down or someone who makes mistakes repeatedly, we all have to choose how we respond in those situations. You say, well, they've done this thing a hundred times. They've messed up a hundred times. Let me ask you a question. In your life, how many mistakes have you made? How many times have you fallen short? Did God give up on you? God forbid. And brothers and sisters, while I'm not saying that we should overlook mistakes or the failures or shortcomings of others, I am saying that what we should do is our very best to help them overcome them. We should spend as little time as possible belittling others for their mistakes or exaggerating and magnifying their mistakes. Instead, we should help them overcome the mistakes. It's been said that strong people don't put others down, they lift them up. And while correction is necessary, we have got to acknowledge that there are many Christians, there are many Christians who have a secret and perverted relish for correcting others. There are Christians and even ministers who have a secret joy in belittling others by loudly pointing out what's wrong because it simultaneously and secretly gets everyone else to notice how they're doing it right. Some men go through life pointing out how others are short, but deep down that is really only because they want others to notice how tall they are. And in all of this type of spirit, men have made haste to form these ministries of rebuke. Have you ever seen a ministry of rebuke? A ministry of rebuke is one of the ministries that goes on every week, calls somebody out by name and puts up some headlines and takes shots at people. Brothers and sisters, there are these ministries of rebuke which make it their business to gain a big following each week by pointing out what this person or that person is doing wrong. But brethren, there is nothing cheaper or easier to do than to point out how others are wrong or how they make mistakes. And it may be true that fault finding and criticizing in the form of claiming to correct people may draw a big crowd, but brothers and sisters, let us remember that not all crowds are healthy. You might find a crowd at a park one day pressing and pushing against each other as they buzz about and crowd in, all trying to get to the closest to the center of the thing which has captivated their attention. Yet is this not the very same behavior that a crowd of flies practices in the presence of a pile of manure? So not all crowds are healthy and not all things which attract crowds are healthy. And it has been rightly said, that what is popular isn't always right, and that which is right isn't always popular. And just because muckraking and fault-finding is popular in many homes, in many churches, in many ministries, it doesn't mean that it's healthy, good, or beautiful. It doesn't mean that God sent it. And there will always be Christian men who are fighting for the right to become the Lord of the Flies. They want to build out the biggest ministry of rebuke, which outbashes every other ministries. And they make the hitman videos, and they call themselves watchmen. And such Lord of the Flies will always draw flies to themselves with such negative tactics. But the truest danger is what they're spiritually infecting their audience with. Usually they infect them with a spirit of imbalance, where their spiritual life becomes nothing more then watching to see how others mess out, pointing out what's wrong, more and more microscopically. And as that infection spreads, their spiritual life becomes fixated on fault finding and attacking others who are wrong. And it trickles into their parenting, in their marriage, their family, their soul. There is nothing in the way of true edification or encouragement, or love. Just video, oh, video after video each week of how we should all be outraged over this thing or that thing with some headlines about it. Now, such men usually relish the mis misguided idea that God has specially chosen them to correct others like some modern-day Jeremiah. But brothers and sisters, if God has sent you not to encourage others, he hasn't sent you to correct them either. The surgeon only ever cuts to heal. And there is a grave danger and imbalance, not just in ministry and in church, but in our parenting, in our marriages, in our life, if all we have a burden to do 
is correct others, but we seldom encourage them. And it is important to understand that on the family level. A husband has to govern intelligently, and so the wife does too. And the children may often need to be corrected and disciplined and so forth for the good of their souls. But if we truly care about the outcome of their souls, we must do it in love and we must not become imbalanced. We must learn that we should encourage them at least as much as we correct them. And I would suggest to you that it should probably be three times or four times as much encouragement as there is correction. But if we correct others without love, brothers and sisters, if you're correcting your children, your wife, your husband, if you're correcting anyone without love, you would do better to tie a millstone to your neck and jump into the ocean, is what Jesus tells us. And I suppose, brothers and sisters, that one of the practical difficulties of encouraging others is when we encounter certain folks in whom we find very little to encourage them about. And in such situations, we're tempted to either remain silent or maybe we'll give them empty praise, give them some cheap praise. But here's a word of caution. Be careful with cheap praise. A man who hands out cheap praise or hands out praise cheaply is soon discovered and all of his praise is seen for the cheap lie that it is. But the man or woman who seeks diligently to find things to sincerely praise and encourage others about even if they're hidden at first glance, God will give you plenty of sincere things that you can praise and encourage people about. And as you do it, you'll learn to reinforce the good and encourage the better. Such men and women like that are world changers, even if they are few and far between in the times that we're living in. They know what to praise and they know what not to praise. Brothers and sisters, praise is like fertilizer. It's good. But be careful what you put it on, because whatever you put it on is going to grow. You should praise people, but make sure you're putting it on the right things. Now, someone might ask me, well, why are there so many people that are fault finders? Why are so many people criticizers? Why are there very few people that encourage others and build others up? If encouragement is such a precious and powerful balm, why are there so many fault finders and criticizers? Because pointing out how people are wrong is easy and encouraging others is difficult. It takes real effort. It takes real love. It takes real prayer. It takes a real spiritual connection with the Almighty God. It takes real patience. Think about it, brothers and sisters. It's easy to whip an unruly horse, to smack him and tie him to a post and break his spirit that, you, that he knows that he's inferior to you and then he begins to obey. On the other hand, it takes real effort, real diligence, even real humility to whisper in love to an unruly and wild horse until it is finally broken by those loving whispers. But how a horse is broken makes all the difference in the world. If you break one with a whip, all it's going to ever understand is the whip, and its miserable life will be nothing more than doing just enough to avoid that whip. And as just as soon as it's old enough, it's going to get a whip out and whip others. But if you train one with love, it will always seek love, and it will only join itself to those who really have love. And while it's true, brothers and sisters, that correction does much, encouragement does more. And something magical happens in the process as we use our tongues to edify, to encourage, to build up. Something magical happens in the process. When you encourage others, you yourself in the very process are encouraged. When you love others, you find yourself becoming more loving. I have a question, and it's an important question. Maybe it's the only question that matters. What are you becoming? Brothers and sisters, what are you becoming? I spoke with a person this week and we took counsel together over a decision that he had to make. And when confronted by the decision and which one to choose, I offered up an important thought to help that person make the decision. And here was the thought. I said, what will you become 
as a result of this decision, ignoring all of the other surface factors of geography and finances and material possessions, I asked him, what will your soul become more and more each day as a result of this decision? Will you become more spiritual? Will you become wiser and more loving, more joyful, more peaceful? What will your soul become more and more each day as a result of this decision one way or the other? And after we talked, I stayed up very late even while others slept and laid hold of a spiritual thought of great importance. Man is a wandering becomer. Man is a wandering becomer. He is always wandering through adventures in life. He may move from one city to the next. He might have different jobs. He may meet many people in many places. And his life is like a long wandering journey that's always changing. But he also becomes something from all of those wanderings. And what he becomes is far more important than his wanderings. Man is a wandering becomer. Brothers and sisters, each day when you encourage others or you find fault and yell at them, you are becoming more and more of something in one way or another as a result. Ignore the roads that you travel. Ignore your shopping lists. Ignore your paychecks and your deadlines. And face with me tonight the most solemn question in regard to our wanderings here on earth. Are you becoming... More Christ-filled each day, encouraging and building up others, helping the weaker ones, the mistaken ones, restoring people and lifting them up. Are you becoming more of that each day? Or are you becoming more and more plunged into darkness each day by finding fault and pointing out how others are wrong, scoffing and ridiculing? Let me ask you this. What are you becoming as a father? As a husband, what are you becoming as a wife, as a mother? What are you becoming as a young man, as a teenage girl? What are you becoming? Now, maybe someone is protesting and they say, well, but, but, but Joshua, listen, though, I get that I point out people are wrong. But listen, I can't help but see that others are wrong. I have great discernment. God gave me great discernment. Somebody is out there saying that. Brothers and sisters, listen very carefully now. Discernment is a God-given gift. God gives us discernment not so that we can find fault with others who are wrong, but so we can make intercession for them and restore them that they may overcome. Let me say it again, brothers and sisters. God gives us discernment not so that we can find fault with others who are wrong, but so that we can make intercession for people and restore them spiritually with prayer and prophecy. If your discernment is leading to point out how others are wrong, so secretly they'll notice that you're tall and they're short. If your discernment is so you can give people a peace of mind and belittle them and say, oh my, my you dumb. It's not discernment from God. You have a devil. You have been possessed by some fallen spirits who have bewitched you and led you to believe that you're doing the work of God by pointing out how others are wrong. But yet, what is the main purpose of Satan in Scripture? It says he's the accuser. The difference, God sees faults. The difference is he doesn't see them to accuse. He sees them to restore. He doesn't run around saying, man, your head is big. Look at that big, ugly thing. He says, I need to help them. There's something wrong with their head. Brothers and sisters, what are we becoming each day? Before I go any further tonight, I want to ask you that question again. What are you becoming and what do you want to become spiritually? you got to make a choice. And whether you are 14, <clears throat> whether you are 14 years old or 64 years old, I want you to know that there is still time to choose. And I would influence your choice a little bit tonight by asking you to become an encourager with me. To lay aside fault finding and criticizing and the loveless corrections that are empty of the spirit of love. And instead become a repairer of the breach and a restorer of souls. Because while encouragement is free 
it is beyond measure in its value. And no act of encouragement, no matter how small, is ever wasted. There it will remain for you, like treasure laid up in heaven, where the bags don't uh, have holes in them, and where the rust doesn't corrupt and destroy. And as we're thinking about this, whether you want to or not, you're going to choose one way or the other. Why not actively make a choice about what you want to become? None of us can go through a single day without having an impact on the world around us. None of us can go through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. The only question is, will it be a good impact or a bad one? An isolated brain is a piece of biological nonsense as meaningless as an isolated human individual. No such thing exists. Our souls are interconnected through vast webs of thoughts, of words, of actions. And my words, my thoughts, my actions undoubtedly reach others and impact others every day just the same as yours. An isolated soul is a piece of spiritual nonsense as meaningless as a grin without a face. Every man or woman's thoughts, words, and actions, your entire life is part of a great spiritual web, a great ocean, connecting all the human souls that have lived and all the human souls that will live. And as you live and move and have your being, you cannot help but impacting others and being impacted by others. You will not go through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. An isolated life is a piece of spiritual nonsense, as meaningless as a circle with an inside but no outside. My question for you tonight, the huge question for you tonight, what will the world become as a result of your interactions with it today? And perhaps more importantly, what are you becoming in your dealings with your surroundings each day. Now, with these spiritual truths in mind, turn with me to Proverbs 25, 11. We finally got to our Proverbs. Sorry, I'm taking a long time to get there. Proverbs 25, 11, you probably heard it before. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Now, we want to look at this proverb tonight and gather in a spiritual lesson from it. First, the proverb tells us that not just any word is an apple of gold. It doesn't just say, just keep talking a lot, and if you talk a lot, there'll be gold everywhere. It says, a word fitly spoken. What does that mean? Well, fitly spoken, maybe that's about timing. Maybe that's speaking about speaking at the fit time. You ever notice someone who knows how to just say a word right on time? Well, that's true, but the Hebrew is saying much more than that. In Hebrew, fitly spoken is the word revolve. It means to revolve, as to go around and return again and again like a big wheel. Maybe not so much like a boomerang, but perhaps like the flywheel of a well pump in some parched desert land revolving again and again. That no matter how many times you tug the handle and revolve the flywheel of the pump, Every single revolution of it will not fail to bring life-giving waters to the thirsty who need them so much. Words fitly spoken are words that are so wise, so good, so true, so encouraging that they never fail to be useful every time that you use them or hear them. You could revolve those words a hundred times, a thousand times, ten thousand years from now. And they will still be so encouraging, so true, so wise, so loving that they're still useful. They revolve again and again in your mind. You said it came up in my mind again. <clears throat> and each time they come up in your mind, they come up with great profit and they are not diminished a bit in strength or power. They do not diminish in strength or power. If you buy a movie ticket, you buy a concert ticket. It has a fleeting value. 
it's only valuable once. Once they tear it in half or they punch it or stamp it, you use it, it's not worth anything. After that, it no longer has any value. It was useful for a minute, but then it has no value. Or how about fireworks? Fireworks are a good example. Fireworks can be quite costly. And you can give fancy shows that dazzle audiences and draw big crowds for a few minutes. But after using them fireworks just a single time, the spent shells no longer have any value. And often you'll see piles of them piled up in the streets and gutters as worthless trash on the 4th of July, the 5th of July. <laughs> Those are examples of things that draw big crowds and excite people but they are worthless in the long run. Our proverb is talking about that. It's talking about the direct opposite of that. It's talking about something that never fails. It's talking about something that doesn't wear out. It's talking about something that is always useful, that if it revolves every single time you use it or hear it, it pours out a wisdom of heaven that quenches the thirst of the soul. Words that no matter how many times you use them still remain as potent and as useful as ever. Now, the second half of this proverb says that words fitly spoken are as apples of gold. An apple of gold is a pretty strange symbol. It could have said bars of gold or shoes of gold or horses of gold, but it says apples of gold. What could this possibly mean and why was such a symbol chosen? Well, in the Hebrews time, apples were a delicious treat and not only delicious, but nourishment to anybody who ate them. Now, we all heard the saying, an, uh, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Maybe you've heard that, right? Uh, but regular apples, like any fruit, are subject to decay and corruption. The moment that you pick an apple from the tree, it begins to die. How many Hebrews were out in the field working hard all day coming home with thoughts of a sweet supper with an apple, only to be disappointed to find out that that apple that they wanted so desperately had rotted, or worse yet, it had a worm in it, because fruit is always doomed to decay. But an apple of gold is an entirely different creature. It's not merely an apple. It's made of gold. That means it is not subject to decay. It cannot rot and it cannot spoil. Because gold never rusts and it never decays. You leave gold in a shipwreck for 300 years and it'll still be gold, complete and entire, despite the harsh, corrosive environment that it finds itself in. And a word fitly spoken is a word that never becomes useless, that never runs out, never rots, and never spoils over time. Now, brothers and sisters, can we call such sensational sermonizing that makes the claim two years ago that the government is going to come in and take your children over the COVID-19 vaccine, can we call those sorts of sermons golden apples? Can we rightly say that all such sensational preaching and predictions have spoiled and that that sort of religion is inherently rotting the moment you receive it because God didn't send it? I have in a folder on my desktop a whole rotten bushel of screenshots from spoiled sermons from sensational preachers over the years who preach incessantly on current events and draw big audiences with sensational predictions from the headlines that week. One of those screenshots shows a certain man claiming that it's over. It was over. The Sunday law was upon us as a result of the Pope visiting a certain place two years ago. He said the Sunday law would come imminently because of the Pope's visit to that place. Now, it did not come to pass, so his words were obviously not golden because they are spoiled, as his predictions spoiled, as all of his predictions spoil. But that has not stopped the thousands of followers from following him right into the valley of rotten fruits and spiritual death. Amidst that bushel of screenshots, there is a most famous of all such sensationalists, Claiming uh, tens, he got tens of millions of views 12 years ago, tens of millions of views 
with the marvelous prediction, he said, this is a golden apple, he said, that Michael Jackson's death is a cover-up for Pope Benedict is coming to New York to the United Nations to foment a Sunday law for the New World Order, and it's upon us, it's over. Twelve years ago, he handed a golden apple out, he said, that Michael Jackson's death was a cover-up and that the Sunday law was coming when Pope Benedict visited New York. Well, brothers and sisters, that has spoiled, and the many predictions that guy has ever made spoil, and they continue to spoil, but his popularity has not diminished, and the people keep eating rotten food from these tables. There is a screenshot in that bushel of rottenness of a certain preacher two years ago who said that because of COVID, martial law was upon us and would be declared within a week. Martial law would be declared. He even had fancy pictures of Humvees lining up in the streets of the cities. Spoiled. What are we becoming, brothers and sisters? What are we becoming? Are you so foolish to keep eating spoiled apples? You need not watch me. You don't have to ever watch me again. I love you. You don't have to watch. But go to God directly. Instead of eating these sensational false prophecies. Instead of trading the priceless heavenly wisdom that the Bible is talking about that cannot spoil. That has power in it. That is useful. Trading it, brothers and sisters, for sensational vain janglings. You know, I know that children like sparklers. Sparklers are very exciting. You know them fireworks sparklers? Sparklers are exciting for a moment, but it is a fool who tries to light his family's house with sparklers as a source of light. Because while sparklers pop and spurt out some sparks and draw much attention to themselves for a few moments, they're soon going to fizz out and you'll find yourself in darkness still. Your house needs light spiritually. And it needs a steady light. It needs a lamp with oil in it, steadily burning bright with a light that covers you and your whole family. Something that transfigures your whole life, where your life becomes living in that spirit of love. Living in the spirit of God, having a transcendent life, far beyond the cheap external religion and excitements of the headlines. But a deep life within the soul, where you become a new creature, where you become a difference maker, where you become an instrument of heaven, a new vessel for God to work through. Brothers and sisters, our houses need light, the steady light from heaven, not the sparklers which fizz with excitement every week before fizzing out again. And this brings us back to our proverb. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Pictures of silver were common. Yet the apples of gold stood out by contrast. They were uncommon. And I would like to close this sermon with three thoughts which will help you to find the better way, the better way that does not spoil and cannot spoil. All of these things that we're going to mention have to do with using your words the golden way. And isn't it time for us to make the change, brothers and sisters? Isn't it embarrassing for you to go to your family reunion, the annual family reunion, and you try to talk to your cousin, your uncle, your, your sister about Jesus Christ, and they laugh at you and say, Yeah, two years ago you told us we were all going to have to take the vaccines and get the mark of the beast because the martial law was coming. And that some conference in Rome was going to bring martial law and your whole family, what? And they don't laugh at you and they don't take you serious. Because you gave them apples that rotted, that God never sent. Aren't you tired of offering people embarrassing words that are only going to spoil? Aren't you ready to share some of the actual gold of heaven and lay aside the things which are destined to disappoint? Lay aside the things which can never fill our families with love, which can never transfigure our souls. Laying aside all of that empty husk and embracing the true golden religion of heaven. Aren't you ready for that? Well, turn with me. We've got three verses about it. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. I'll offer you three verses. 1 Thessalonians 5 in verse 11. And I'm going to paraphrase this one in modern English so we can get closer to its meaning. Here it goes. Wherefore, encourage one another and build one another up 
even also as you do. Now, it takes practice, brothers and sisters, to encourage others and build others up. And the real reason that Sabbath keepers are so poor at it is because they spend so little time doing it. Most of them spend their time warning others every week, year in and year out, about things that never happen anyway. Or there's a large group who are busy arguing over doctrines that don't matter. The Bible says encourage one another and build one another up. And the real reason that many of us are so poor at it is because we spend so little time doing it. And here we arrive at our first helpful principle if you're ready for a new life in Christ. For a word to have any chance, for a word to have any chance at being fitly spoken, it must first be at least spoken. The most common failure of Christian love is the failure to express it. If you love someone, tell them. If you love someone, show them with your actions. Now, it's true that if you attempt to encourage others or build somebody up, you may fail. But at least if you try, you will be certain that you have a chance. Brothers and sisters, if you don't try, you can be certain that you will fail. A farmer may not plant many crops, and, uh, well, he, he says, well, I plant crops, and some of them make it and some of them don't. Such are the hazards of farming. But if he plants no crops, just because some of them might fail, he can be certain that he won't have any fruit. You might be saying, well, I'm not very good at encouraging others. I'm not very good at building others up. You know, listening to others is a key step in that. Listening to what they're saying, God will help you. Take the tin can telephone in this ear and listen to them. And take the tin can telephone in this ear and listen to God on the other ear. And let God speak to you, through you, to them. Encourage them, build them up. Brothers and sisters, you may not be very good when you begin. But the real reason so many of us are very bad at it is because we're busy doing other things instead of doing it. Somebody has said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So then my first word for you is to be intentional about encouraging others and building others up. Give it a try, brothers and sisters. Maybe it's a stranger at the gas station. Maybe it's somebody you work with. You might do poorly at first, but so what? Every artist was at first an amateur who stuck with it and got better. Brothers and sisters, how we use our mouths is important. It is important. You know, the alligator can slam his mouth shut with thousands of pounds of force per square inch. The jaws of an alligator have some of the strongest and most violent muscles in nature, capable of slamming shut and destroying almost anything within reach. But did you know that as strong as it is at crushing others with its mouth, the alligator is terribly weak at opening its mouth? And that a person, even a child, could go up to an alligator and with a single hand could easily hold an alligator's mouth shut. Don't be an alligator, brothers and sisters. I know a lot of alligator Christians. They seem to have a lot of power to crush others with their mouth, to bite others, to criticize and attack others with their mouth, and they spend a lot of their time doing it. But when it comes time to open their mouths to say a kind, encouraging, or upbuilding word, they find themselves terribly weak. They can't open their mouth and encourage someone. That's, 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 that's hard. Well, you know one of the most encouraging and upbuilding words that a Christian can say to somebody else? I'm sorry. Or I was wrong after all. But when it's time to do this, we often find ourselves too weak like some little pathetic alligator. We had all the strength in the world to crush him with our words. But we're like a pathetic little alligator. Let our children spill their cereal and we shout and scream and we berate them and crush them with our words. What you doing? We yell at them and we bite them. Five, six, seven, eight times we do this. But when they do a hundred good things in front of us, we find it hard. The hundred times they do good things to open our mouths and praise them for doing the right thing. What fools are we, brothers and sisters? What fools are we? It's been said that if you want your children to improve, let them overhear the nice things you say about them to others. You might want to chew on that apple, brothers and sisters. Now, here's our second thought in our second verse, Hebrews 10 and verse 24. So the first thing, get started. 
Get started. What are you becoming? What do you want to become, brothers and sisters? Well, then get started. What are you going to wait? You'll be 70 years old. Say, I want to really live a life where I was an inspiration to people. That God flowed through me. I really want that life. And when I'm 73, I'm going to start. Brothers and sisters, if you're 73, that's fine. Get started. But don't wait till you're 73. Hebrews 10 and verse 24. Here's our second one. Hebrews 10 and 24, it says, And let us consider one another. i just stop right there. How can you be a considerate person without first considering others? Someone says, oh, so-and-so, he is so considerate. How are you so considerate? And the person gave a marvelous answer. He said, I consider people. I think about them. I pray for them. I think about other people. I'm not like wrapped up in myself all the time. I, I'm a considerate father. I'm a considerate husband. I'm a considerate brother because I'm thinking about those people. I'm considering them. And the verse says, consider one another to inspire unto love and good works. Now, the word provoke in Greek here in your King James is wrong because provoke in modern English is confrontational. That's not what it says in Greek. In Greek, it says inspire. It says be considerate and while being considerate of others, inspire others to love and good works. And notice how love and good works are in tandem. They're in tandem with each other. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Though I have good works, so I uh, help the poor, I give my body to be burned. If I have not love, I have nothing. Our verse says, don't just inspire others to good works. Inspire them to love and good works. Now, inspire, as Kenneth is watching, he knows that's a medical word. Inspire is the medical word for breathing in. And just like CPR, you can breathe in in and inspire life into a dead body and bring it back to life spiritually. Ezekiel does it in chapter 37, Ezekiel. He prophesies and he tells the bones what? What is the prophecy Ezekiel gives? He sees a valley of dry bones. They're all dead, rotten, dried out. This is a bad situation. But he prophesies and tells them they shall live. He says it several times. These bones shall live. And somehow there was power in Ezekiel's words despite the outer circumstances. Brothers and sisters, let me say this slowly. A lot of people have gone further than they thought they ever could because someone thought they could. A lot of people have gone further than they ever thought they could because someone thought they could. And if you would truly understand what I just said to you, you would possess one of the most sacred keys to happiness and the well-being of those who surround you. It takes little effort to tell someone else they are doing better when they are. It takes little effort to say, I believe you're going to make it. Don't be discouraged. I can see that you're doing better. It takes little effort to say, you know what? You aren't where you, where you want to be yet, but I can see that you're not where you started, that you're making it. Now think about that apple of gold and pictures of silver once more. It says pictures of silver back there in our verse. I have pictures of silver in every bathroom of my house. And so do you. These large rectangles of silver, these pictures of silver that hang right over the wall there on the sink, above the sink. And when you look at those pictures of silver, you see a reflection of what you are at this moment. Yet the apple of gold is something greater than that. It's not merely looking at what is in the silver, but the gold that will come. It is to look into the reflection in that silver and see the gold hidden in it. Now, many folks can only see the silver at first, but standing with them, the wise and spiritual ones say, yes, I see that. Yes, I see how you are. I see who you are. I see your reflection very clearly. But you have potential. I can see that too. There is some gold hidden in the midst of that silver. I can see that you have potential. And if you stick with such and such, and if you hold fast to God, there is no limit to what you can become in Christ Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, that is an incredible thought. Not just looking in the mirror honestly at what is there, but telling them what could be there. Encouraging others. Now, we don't want to puff up our children. We don't want to give people false hopes. But brothers and sisters, there is no limit to how powerful it is to point out the potential in another person. There are grown adults who have never had anyone tell them that they have potential to improve and be something. 
Is there anything more sad than to hear somebody 50 years old, 30 years old, who has made shipwreck of life, who had parents who yelled at him, who had people who always told him they were stupid. Is there anything more sad to hear a 30-year-old who believed them lies? And you say, no, I absolutely think you could do it. I, yeah, I, you could totally do this. And you know they could, and you know they could. And they say, no, I'm too stupid. I can't do that. I always mess stuff like that up. I'm too stupid. There are grown adults who have never had anyone tell them that they have the potential to improve and that God will help them to get better. Well, then hear us. Send us, Lord. Send us. Show us the buried talents in people. Show us, Lord, what they can become in Christ and give us the courage and wisdom to speak those words to help them on their journey. Let us speak spiritual words that revolve in their minds again and again, bringing life and health to their soul. Now I'll offer one more verse. It's Hebrews 13 and 2, last verse of the night. Hebrews 13 and 2, it says this, <clears throat> Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, whereby some have entertained angels unawares. Brothers and sisters, is this verse moonshine or not? Is God serious about this through his prophet here? Are there really angels or is he just pulling our leg? Are there really angels who take the appearance of humans and associate among us? I'm sure that he is serious. And notice the verse. It says, don't be forgetful about how you treat strangers. It says, God places angels in our midst and he watches us to see how we treat strangers. And while the words you speak day in and day out seem small, they seem like it makes a small impact. You never know the stranger that you may help with encouraging words and upbuilding words. A kind word that is sent from heaven can change somebody's entire destiny. Be careful to entertain strangers whereby you may have entertained angels unawares. You never know. You may find yourself saying, Lord, when did I encourage you? Lord, when did I ever visit you in prison? Lord, when did I ever feed you when you were hungry? And the Lord say, inasmuch as you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't wait. Don't miss your opportunity that your mouth would be a vessel of love for God. You never know what heavenly opportunity you might be throwing away. Don't miss your opportunity to encourage others, to build others up, to edify others, to serve up apples of gold from heaven because you were too busy sharing theories about current events and conspiracies. My ultimate closing thought tonight is this. What you do every day is what you're going to become. What are you becoming? And what do you want your soul to become more of this week? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, forgive our sins, forgive our trespasses. Father, you see the thorns that many of us were born into. You see the hand-me-down inherited behaviors and propensities that many of us have easily taken to. We say it shall not be named among us any longer. Lord, we decree a rematch. We demand another chance. We draw a line into sand, Lord. We we will stand and fight. We will take our position with you in love, praying for our enemies, 
speaking life, ruling over our spirits. Sanctify our mouths, Lord. Let our lips be a sweet, acceptable sacrifice. We give them on the altar to you. We pray, Father, as the world is struggling dearly without a spirit of encouragement, a spirit of hope, a spirit of goodness, as it is struggling and strangling under the scoffing and mocking and fault finding, which is so cheap and easy and so popularly embraced, we ask not to be in that crowd, Lord. As husbands, as wives, as mothers, as fathers, as young sons, young daughters, teenagers, all of us, Lord, we are asking, set us apart. Set a watch before our lips. Let the holy angels guide us, sing that beautiful song from Zion through us. Forgive our sins and lead us in this new path, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I love you guys, and thank you for joining in. And um, if you have any prayer requests, any messages like that, shoot us a message. At this very moment, there's a good chance that I'm sitting next to one of our close spiritual friends uh, in another state as we are attending. A, there's a conference, but we're not going to see the whole conference. I'm just going for one little piece of that thing. Uh, but nonetheless, I love you guys. I pray that this was meaningful to you. I'm not trying to bash anyone. I'm tired of that nonsense. Um, when we correct, it should always be in the spirit to restore. Sometimes you do have to point out what's wrong, but only so people can grab what's right. And uh, I pray that any of this made sense to you. I pray that it was a blessing to you. For all of those who pray for us, please keep praying for us. For all of us who support, thank you for your financial support. These things would be impossible without you. God is using you. God uses people in different ways. And so I'm very grateful. It would be impossible to do this if there was not a larger body helping out with that. And I'm very grateful for that. Now, tomorrow there will be another sermon at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube. 1 p.m. Uh, join in. Love to see you guys. Until then, God bless.